All right, so this one, this this is not the first time that that has happened. So it's all good. It's set us up different this time, though. Put how does it look on your side? It looks a more clear, actually. Well, now we were side by we were side by side before. Now it's top, but maybe it's because of my own. Oh, you have speaker view yeah, or gallery view? Oh no, I got it. It, it worked okay. out. So cool. let me see. Make sure we're recording. All right, here we go. Part two, take two. Brocky here, whiskey and kick, sipping with Brocky. I'm here with Aleka from Holding Co. Hi. Doesn't it feel like we did this before? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so we met. So let's go this route. We met yeah. at an event like what two years ago, maybe. I think, yeah, it, it's been a while, huh? Yeah, we met at this event and you had the whole table set out. And this is the first time I had seen an entire table with such um, a variety of booze and one person. So I didn't understand this concept. So what's the concept behind the uh, holding Co? Yeah, so we actually started as a distilling company. Uh, well, let me backtrack. We actually started off as a brewery. Um, are you familiar with like Maytag appliances and Maytag? Yes. Yeah. So this gentleman named Fritz Maytag, he used to drink Anchor Steam beer throughout San Francisco, and he hated how inconsistent it was. So mm -hmm. with all his Maytag money, he bought the or the brewery. <laughs> wow. And was, yeah, and was like, I'm going to make it consistent. Um, and then from there, he got into distilling. And this is the mid '90s we're talking when everyone's drinking flavored vodka. You know, they're not even thinking about whiskey really. And he put out Old Potrero, mm -hmm. which was the first 100%, um, yep, malted rye whiskey distilled from the grain post prohibition. Okay. Yeah, so from there, they made um, Junipero, which it was the first craft gin. That's the new oh. bottling. And then they got some steam and started acquiring brands from all over the world. Um, Luxardo, and that's when they became an importer at that point with price imports. Wow. Yeah, so Luxardo. I mean, you can probably see our expansive you know, portfolio behind us. Um, Nika, Cavalon, Barsol. And then uh, the brewery actually sold about a year, or about, no, about two years ago to Sapporo, the Japanese beer. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and then we had to change our name and likeliness because it was Anchor Distilling, so we changed it to Hodling and Co. in reference to AP Hodling. Okay. So we're constantly acquiring brands, we're constantly uh, repackaging our flagship ones. Yeah, so that's, that's dope. Okay, so I understand, um, because you do read, like, I come across a bunch of different spirits, of course, in, in this business, and you find out that one company owns a bunch of them. So it's yeah. kind of like, that's basically what this is. Because I looked on some of the bottles you sent me, and I see Hodling Co. on the bottle, mm -hmm. but others you, others you don't. So I'm assuming the ones that have Hodling on them, maybe you guys uh, distill the Right, yeah, right. Yeah, so we call it, like, I guess our internal talk would be our owned brands. Okay. And then brands like Nika, Luxardo, um, our partner brands or agency brands. Um, okay. And what makes us really unique is as opposed to other um, big guys out there is our own brands. We still make from small batch. We're still a craft distillery. So we have the best of both worlds, which is really nice. So the, the actual, are you at the distillery now? So we're in limbo right now, but I'm at, I'm at our offices, which okay. is downtown San Francisco, right across the street from the Transamerica building. I was going to ask, where in San Francisco is that? Yeah. San Francisco is packed. It's so packed. I know it's kind of weird because there's no one in the street. So I'm like, is this what San Francisco is like? Is it an apocalypse? <laughs> but our original distillery was off of Mariposa Street um, near Old Potrero Hill, hence Old Potrero, the name for our whiskey. Um, our stills are still there, but since we sold, since the brewery was sold to Sapporo, we had to move the distillery. And right now, we are in the works of finding a new home. But oh, we, wow. yeah, but they're still making. We're still allowed to distill um, in the basement until okay. a couple years, I think. Now, um, you, we talked about this a little bit before. Before we had the technical difficulty. <laughs> so you are from the DMV, and. Yeah. Um, you, you made this move out there you know, professionally or whatever. Of course, mm -hmm. you pick your life up and go out to San Francisco. How do you like the city? 
I feel like I'm kind of like cheated right now. Like, I, well, I would say I love it right now because there's no traffic. I can get across oh, I the know. city. I know. I know. I live in Berkeley, so coming, everyone's like, you got to the city in 18 minutes? I was like, yeah. They're like, that's not normal. Right. But what I will say um, of the places that are open, there's everyone is so hospitable. They're so welcoming. Um, they're so innovative and they're willing yeah. to collaborate, which is really fun. Um, so I can't wait for us to get this, this COVID under control and I can start hitting one of the best dining scenes in America. Oh my God. Listen, I've been to San Francisco maybe three times, I think. Oh. And, uh, you know, back when I was, when I was married and so we went out there a few times and I'm going to tell you the first time I went to San Francisco, I bought, um, I bought a suitcase there because the shopping in San Fran is, is bananas. Like I was, I, I was taking it back. I had no clue. And I went crazy. Oh, yeah. I made sure I put myself on a strict budget because yeah. I knew coming out here because I visit for our national company meeting every year. I said, no, honey, no, no, no. Because <laughs> I would be broke going back home if I was shopping. Because like you're right, it's so good. It's just the food, the the drinks, the shopping, oh even though you have God. a beach. It's yeah, so nice. I was on the street, I was like, is that a Prada store? Oh, no, it's like God. Prada, Bulgari, like Montclair. Everything. So yeah, I love it out there. And of course, the, um, I mean, I have my issues with San Francisco, um, you know, some other stuff. We won't get into that, right? <laughs> but the, um, the art, the, uh, the architecture, yeah. um, you know, just the way the streets are made, the trolleys, all these things, it's, it's, and there's so much history there. I love yeah. it. Yeah, and then speaking of the history, I mean, there is, I mean, so we're right across from the Trans-America uh, building, but next to it is um, the A, um, AP Hodling, their old offices and building. And what's really cool about that is their building survived their great earthquake and fire of uh, 19, 1910, I believe it, or sorry, 1990, I believe it was in San Francisco. Wow. And why that's so crazy is like a warehouse full of booze didn't blow up during a fire. That could have been catastrophic. Very bad. <laughs> Wait, where's that building at? Um, it's not down by the pier, is it? Oh my God, you're you're quizzing me on this car pier. Oh, okay, 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 it's okay. It's okay. All I know is that it's on Montgomery Street <laughs> <laughs> near Chinatown. So okay, so it's up there. It's not gone. It's not behind. Yeah. So do you know the big like the triangular building? If you look at the skyline, yeah. Um, that's the tri that's the building that we're literally across the street from. Oh, okay, okay, all right, because. I was thinking down by the pier, you had like the bread company. I think it was a bread company down there by the pier. And okay. I was, because the name, right, for some reason, is ringing. I might have walked by it when I was in because I did stay in Chinatown one time, too. But, yeah. uh, you know, and I've been all around San Francisco, so I might have seen the building and just not known what it was. When you come back, we'll have to have a dram. <laughs> you know it. That is a given. Um, so, speaking of, I see the, the poster behind you with the Hirsch. Let's talk about Hirsch. Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, we are a importer and distillery, so, or distiller. So um, what's really cool about Hirsch, a lot of people might have seen this bottling of it. Oh wow. yeah, that one, that's the new one. But this is a real familiar one. So um, Hirsch, the story of Hirsch actually started in 1974. Right. Um, it was started from the old Michter's distillery near, oh. um, yeah, near Schaeferstown, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And what was really cool, um, Adolf Hirsch, he actually commissioned 400, a 400-barrel 400 batch by uh, Dick Stoll. He's like a legendary distiller. And with that mash, um, you know, Pennsylvania during the 70s, 80s, it's all about that rye, right? So he had his bourbon, but then he was like, the mash bill, I believe it was like 75% corn, 30% rye, and the rest was malted barley. Mm -hmm. um, but then what happened is he had all these barrels and he never sold them. Wow. Yeah. So the, um, the, the distillery went bankrupt and then Gordon Hugh, um, in 1989, who's actually with, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, Jillian Van Winkle. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Van Winkle, a whiskey. He actually acquired it and then bottled it at the, um, Van Winkle distillery under the name. A. H. Hirsch for the 16 year whiskey. Oh, so, yeah. So and then from there. My, so, raise my hand question. So, yeah. why didn't he bottle that stuff? Do you know why? 
Yeah, so he just honestly was like an investment and then he kind of just forgot about it and then he went bankrupt. So he didn't have the means to bottle it. Oh my God. So all right? Barrels. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, and then um, in 91, uh, they released that 16-year-old, um, it's what they call the gold foil label of A.H. Hirsch. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like the legendary, like the best bourbon you'll never have that they have out there. Um, and then in 2003, they did another um, bottling of, I'm sorry, the first one was the blue, uh, blue wax. And then in 1993, they did another one of the gold foil okay. for 2003. And that one was done in uh, Frankfort, Kentucky and um, was a little bit allocated. And then they kind of really didn't release any new juice. And then in 2002, Henry Price, um, the former owner of uh, our company, acquired the names and rights of Hirsch. Okay, nice. And then that's when they started doing a straight bourbon. So people are familiar, straight bourbon, very similar, like a regular bourbon, except for they have a little bit more stricter laws. You can't have any coloring or, flavoring at it and it has to be aged for a minimum of two years um but it can be aged up to five um if it is blend the youngest whiskey has to be on that label so um there's a different a legal difference between straight bourbon and just bourbon yes yeah they, i didn't know that yeah oh my god so they yeah it's crazy the american whiskey market they have like something we did like over like 52 definitions of or categories of whiskey right and then in the bourbon category alone i think there's like over like 10 or 12. okay got you okay all right i, I could understand that concept then because yeah, to- then you go like high ride you have straight bourbon mm-hmm. um all these different variations but it really just kind of allude to what's in it Right. And then they did a high rye bourbon, which is going to be still more corn, but high of a higher rye content. Uh-huh. And then we <laughs> wanted to really anchor the brand, right? And mm-hmm. say, let's try to start from scratch, essentially, and work with MGP for the first bottling, which you're familiar with. Yep. You know, they put everyone's juice out. Yep. So we came out with Hirsch, the Horizon. I have my, I have my Instagram live here on the side, so I'm letting them oh, see. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so what we did with this is we actually laid down some um, barrels with Barnstown, which you talked to, Nick, last week. So okay. in a couple of years, maybe a little bit less than that, we'll have our own juice. And what Barnstown, they're doing as opposed to MGP, as opposed to MGP giving you guys or giving us like set mash bills, And then blending with Barnstown, we had the ability to go to them and say, we want this to be 75% corn, 13% rye, 12% malted barley, and they can blend it to our needs. Right. Um, So then the second iteration of Hirsch will be, that's going to be the second bottling. So you'll be able to have a whole collector's item of Hirsch. Yes. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, I opened it up and poured it before just to let it kind of chill for a little bit before I... Yeah. And I smelled it, and I'm going to tell you, this is, I haven't tasted this yet, but I am sure this is my kind of bourbon because I smelled that corn. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and what's really nice about this, so if you if you turn your bottle in the back, you know, we're all about transparency. So we have no shame that it's coming from NGP because everyone does it. So it lays it out. It gives you the ratio. So this one's 95% corn. I'm sorry, 94% of this barrel is a five-year, four-month, 75%. Yep. 21% corn awry and 4% malted barley. The other one is 6% is six years, two months, 60% corn, 30% rye and 4% barley. Right. So how, I mean, you really get transparency with this brand. Yep. Um, and a lot of people say there's a lot of like competition in this kind of like MGP for the price point. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just think it's just, I don't, I'm not a big bourbon girl. I'm a rye. I'm from the East coast. I'm a Marylander. Okay, yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so I like, though, how they have a little, um, it is so much of that rye content that helps cut through the sweetness of the bourbon. That's true, that's true. I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and then just the packaging is just so beautiful. Like, you noticed it, too, the etchings on the side. Beautiful. Have, right? And then if you go on the um, top of it, you have the Hirsch kind of um, direction, the compass as well. It's just... Mm-hmm. And it stands out on a shelf. You know, a lot of shelves, you have like the dull kind of washed out brown, black yeah. labels. Yeah. Yeah, That's it stands hurt. out, even the shape of the bottle. And I just noticed while I'm sitting here looking at the mash bill, 
that um, the inside of the front label has a story. Yeah, so this one just gives you like a little snippet of what we kind of talked about, you know, about um, Adolf Hirsch and starting his distillery in 1974. Um, and then if anyone who wants to grab a bottle, I know we just started releasing it across the US in select markets, but if they go to reservebar.com, um, they can actually get it delivered to their house. Hey, there you go. Let me holler at Reserve Bar, man. Yeah, something. yeah. It's so, really dope. You gonna sip with me? Are you sipping too? Yeah, I'll have a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I am a true rye girl, huh? Yes. <laughs> Twist my arm for some whiskey. Right, right. All right, man. This oh, is, yeah. Y'all, this is smelling so good. Yeah, so what I love about this bourbon, um, it, like you said, it really changes. And I always tell people, like, how do you figure out if you like rye or bourbon? Or rye or, um, yeah, rye or bourbon. I always say, like, if you tend to, like, eat cornbread, you like that sweeter, so you kind of go for that bourbon, right? If you like rye bread that has more of that spicy, then maybe you might like rye. Um, I also do the coffee and tea reference, too. Mm -hmm. um, or ask people how you like your coffee. Right. Um, to kind of get that direction. It can be me. I like both. I, I like, like right? And I exactly. Love so that's where the Hirsch comes into play. Oh. Well, cheers. Cheers to you. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> God, it's mm. so good. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Oh my God, the sweetness is this. It's crazy. and it's within like it gives some sweetness, and then right when you think it's gonna be like, so you're like, oh my God, that's too sweet. It goes boom. There's that uh, rye. Nope. Yeah, yeah. That rye, that rye kind of shoots through. It's a perfect cut, and that's yeah. like not too much. Right through. So you're still gonna get uh, that. Um, but the sweetness is there. Like this is my kind of bourbon. I love this. I mean, this is something you can sip all day. Um, I love to make highballs. With mm. this, um, and since it does have that sweeter and that spicy characteristic, you can do the classic clap applications like a Boulevardier with like Luxardo Bitteroso. Uh huh. I love. A, I call it a Boulevardier. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know Frank. You know Frank Mills. Uh, who doesn't? I know, right? He put me onto the Boulevardier, man. It's one of my favorite. I think he even has it tattooed on him. He does have a tattoo. I sent him a Boulevardier T-shirt too. <laughs> right. There you go. So um, let's talk about um, about you. Like, how'd you get into into booze? Period. Like, did you start yeah. off drinking or anything like that? Yeah, I always say I think it was kind of hospitality just runs in my blood. I started when I was 15 years old, um, hostessing at the Clyde's Restaurant Group. Okay. Yeah. Um, so sad because the original Clyde's that I worked at, Clyde's of Columbia, just went under. Oh wow. So, yeah, it was so sad. Um, okay. But. When I was hostessing, I, I wasn't just a hostess. Like I would be like kind of like a server assistant. And I just love the fast pace of the restaurant. And what Clyde's did, I mean, this was like 2001, right? So what they did what was so like very uh, rare at the time. They put everyone through a wine boot camp. And then wow. they were also one of the first people or restaurant groups doing the whole farm to table, working with local farms. Mm -hmm. So getting that exposure early on, it made me really fall in love with the craft and the craftsmanship of artisanal spirits, food, wine, mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I went to school, loved partying, and I... <laughs> became one of those promo girls that you would see in the bars. Yes. And I was like, wait, I can make a living off of having a good time? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm doing it anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. And then I, um, at the time I was working for Bacardi. So at, out of college, I got, I was very fortunate enough and I worked with them for five years. Um, I was one of their experiential brand managers, dealt with, um, had like three markets with Bombay Sapphire. I launched do you say? Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I loved it, you know, and I was looking for more opportunities. Um, and so what I ended up going to is a local distillery in DC called 18 Distilling. Yes. Yep, I was there for a little bit, a little bit under a year, and um, I decided to kind of flex my wings and went to Diageo. Okay. And 
Yeah, realize that's one of those companies they own a bunch of stuff, right? They own everything. <laughs> right, right. That's a, I couldn't remember the name earlier, but that's exactly who I was talking about. Yeah, they're the number one uh, supplier in the world. You know, and they, I mean, it was a great time with them. I learned so much from them. Yeah. Um, but what I just didn't like is I have a true passion for craft brands. I have a passion for the stories and yeah. not the cases, essentially. Yeah. And so um, I, I was, I fell out of love with the business. You know, I was just waking up and going to people and saying, bring all this in and very goal oriented. Yeah. So I decided, let's see it out there. What else is out there? Mm -hmm. And then I found Hodling and it's literally the perfect marriage of the big guys, but it's the story of these, these distillers, these families, you know, that I get right. to tell. And I feel like every case that I sell of like old Potrero, I can say like Bruce made it, you know, like we're all re like, I can track the dollar essentially, right. which is so right. nice nowadays. Yeah. That's, that's dope. Um, and I understand exactly what you mean. I, that's kind of like the nature of what I do. You know, I'm, I'm here for the craft side. Yeah. Of even though I do need to cover, I do plan to cover the other side. Like, Absolutely. You know. Listen, and we have a couple of like single malts and Irish whiskeys that we um, just acquired. And we always say like, if it wasn't for the Jameson, our, our Irish distilleries would probably wouldn't be able to be here today. You know, they yeah, have certain everything. categories alive for us yeah. to be able to really bring more whiskeys to the, um, to the market. So yeah. So how long have you been in San Francisco now? Oh my God, like six weeks. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I, I, I feel very gracious and fortunate that you thought about me and reached out. That's dope. Yeah, no, you're actually my first interview. I had one lined up and I, I had too much going on and I wasn't mentally in the space to really give it my time. So I was like, let me... Yeah, this is where you need to be first. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to give Whiskey and Kicks my inaugural <laughs> West Coast interview. <laughs> Yo, know, that, that's dope. And when I come out there, we got to do, you know what I'm saying, we'll do something else. You know, hopefully. Absolutely. By then, I have um, some kind of budget. You know, maybe I'll bring my producer <laughs> out and we'll make something happen. And hopefully, you guys get your distillery together, you know? Yeah. And if not, you can always, you know, come to the office and see what we got going on. Um, the distillery probably, well, most likely until we get a new distillery, we're still going to be like, you know, running things there. Um, and I don't I just, we have so many exciting things that are just in the pipeline, especially with Hirsch. It's been doing so well. Um, so and you I just launched this not too long ago. Yeah, like maybe like four months ago. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Is this Time is kind of like like this to me right now. Yeah, I bet. I bet. It's it's a, um that's this has it has to be going crazy for you. So do you guys have um is this out here yet? DC, it is in DC. Okay, nice. Yeah, it is in DC. I know um, some of, uh, I think they might have just got their first allocation, I want to say. Um, mm -hmm. But if you can't find it in your areas, um, there's two ways you can figure it out. One, like I said, if you go to reservebar.com, yeah. um, it's there. It can get shipped right to your door. Or if you go to hodelingandco.com, uh, we actually have a product locator. Yep. So you put your zip code in, figure out what product you want to find, and we'll tell you where closest to your house it is. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I love it. I mean, I even put it in highballs. It's just, it's just a good whiskey. It really is. How many, um, how many employees do you guys have out there? Like, how big is your operation there in, in, like, in your office? Yeah, I mean, we're small. We only literally have like 64 employees. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, and we went from, I think, I think it was like, a little bit under 20 to mid 30s up to 64 um like a lot of companies they'll have huge marketing departments with like multi layers we have like one person you know covering a whole whiskey department so when i say we are craft and we're small we have these big names but we we like to keep it very uh boutique which is nice because we can kind of still push the brand's agendas uh -huh. but also be connected to the con to the consumer yeah for sure and what's your exact role with them yeah, so I'm what they call our business development manager. Nice. Yeah, it sounds so fancy, developing businesses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you, you had the personality for it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, to be honest, it's, I love what I do. I mean, I really get a chance to, like, go to people, talk about whiskeys. I mean, every now and then I'll get that, like, person trying to challenge your whiskey 
knowledge, you know, and like have like a pissing contest and I, I'll let them win, you know, right. you know, I just, I just love it. And I love being able, <laughs> cause I think one thing that connects people around the world is food and drinks and how you, that hospitality factor, how it brings it together. You can go all around the world and based on, you can ask a simple question, what's your favorite drink? Uh -huh. And that simple question opens up a world of conversation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then from there, you know, I just, in the craftsmanship, and then it opens your eyes and boosts, takes you to places I never thought I would be. Like, right. I never thought I'd be buddy and buddy with the Taiwanese embassy. <laughs> How about that? You know, <laughs> we're like doing like events with like, doing Angie Martinez book launch, you know, and it's all because yeah. people want boots, you know? Don't, people don't realize um, how extensive and of a career you could have in yeah. this industry. Like most people think, well, I'm, I'm not gonna say most, a lot of people think it's, it starts and, be, and ends at Fridays. You know, I'm just gonna get it's myself, so you know you know what I mean? And it's yeah. so important to it. And I think we kind of get, um, how do I say this? We kind of get a misconceived notion of the market because we live on the coastal states, right? And they're so advanced. They are always pushing the envelope, but we forget yeah. about that middle America where, yeah. you know, Fridays is where it's the pop and Friday night and they're still doing the hurricanes with all the juices and stuff. So, and what it I love what about- it is. it is what it is. It is what it is, yeah. So, but I think what's cool, one thing that this, COVID situation has happened is it made our world smaller in a sense to where people are being able to stop and maybe even research smaller brands like us via Zooms, Instagram Lives. And then hopefully they'll start asking for more craft because they're becoming more interested and more educated in the making of their spirits. Absolutely. Listen, I, I know I can attest to that for sure with my brand. People are always like, oh man, I couldn't find that whiskey you was talking about. Like they, they're out there looking for it and they're trying. They are. You're trying cocktails because you can do this at home. Like I'm doing this at home, you know? Yeah. You, you know, can, so and, and what I like about it at home too is like, sometimes when a bartender or server recommends a whiskey or a wine, sometimes you feel pressure to be like, yeah, I like it. I don't like it. <laughs> right, right. So at home, you can be like, I don't like it, whatever. You have a freedom to explore. Um, yeah. And then you can do it safely because you can just go straight to your bed and pass out. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. And <laughs> Or, or you can go online drunk and order some sneakers. I'm not saying I did that. I'm just saying it could happen. <laughs> I have done that. And then you forget. And then you're like, what's this? Oh, right. Christmas right. morning. Yeah. I know. I used, to, I used to be a sneaker head. And my you shoe, know? this is going put to my, put my age. Let me see. <laughs> but I used to, remember the pastries? Which one? The pastries? So, um... Rev Run, his daughters, Vanessa oh, and Angela, yes. they put out pastries and they were all like dessert style sneakers. That is incredible. I forgot, you all remember about that? Those. I forgot all about those. And they had like chocolate mousse, strawberry shortcake, and like, and I literally was, so I'm the type of person where like either I buy something, I want to keep it in pristine condition. Or I buy it and I ruin it until yeah. it's done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, and I love these shoes so much. And my brother is a sneakerhead. He's walls of Jordans. Right. And so I was like, like my Jordan. And I bought them, but I would never wear them. Right. <laughs> because That's I just wanted to keep them in condition. Did you ever? So I got rid of them. I know. You never wore them? I never wore them. I oh my them. God. You but just like, wore them. <laughs> yeah. And I even like, I think I may have worn them like one or two times. And then I realized how much of a peak it was to like polish them and do all the things. And I was like, I'll just stick to my Birkenstocks. <laughs> that is hilarious. So what do you prefer now? I am such a, like, I'm so low maintenance. I am, when it comes to like tennis shoes, it's whatever's on sale. You right. know, honey, okay. okay. <laughs> Okay. But like I'm the classic person too. Once I find something I like, I will buy it over and over for years. Right. Um, and plus, being in the industry for so many years, bartending and managing, I tend to go for like running shoes. So I love like Brooks and Asics. Okay. 
Yeah, Asics got a little Air Force One on every now and then. Okay. okay. See, but look, look. Let's let me clear the let me clear the air right now. Whiskey and kicks. We're not about boutique. We're not. We don't. Okay, care. Cool. You have the top of the line sneakers or a, a hundred or a thousand pair. Whatever you put on your feet, there's a reason why. And Listen, so, and I, what yeah. is it? You know what I mean? And I want to talk about it. So I don't. I don't. There's no judgment here. If you wear penny loafers every day, then that's cool. That's the funny you think. I. That's my favorite shoe is a loafer. <laughs> I see. I I see penny loafer in you. <laughs> <laughs> I love this loafer. Oh my god! Like a flat shoe. Like I'm all. About, I'm a Birkenstock flip flopper. Like, and I'm like Native American, so you will catch me without a pedicure. I don't care. I'm like I'm one with the earth. Okay. <laughs> 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 right, I, got, I got cases of still, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you so silly, bro. No, but what I think what's really cool about whiskey and bourbon or, or, or shoes and um and whiskey or kicks is the craftsmanship, right? Yeah. Uh, kind of going back to Frank, you know, he did he had this like shoe that he like unboxed and sometimes I'll like what all their just shoes, you know, but he was, they're like some shoes that were like recycled materials and how, as he was like going through each part of it, yeah. I'm like, that's why I fell in love with the pastries or I see why people love Jordans or become these yeah. huge sneakerheads because the craftsmanship of the, of a, of a shoe mm -hmm. and the craftsmanship of a whiskey, they, they're like hand in hand, you know, yeah, so it goes into it. Collectors of both. Right, yeah, you pick up a good sneaker, you're like, oh my god, this is not the regular. Because a lot of these sneakers that people think are leather, they're not. They're they're synthetic materials. Mm -hmm. And when you get a pair of sneakers and you're like, oh, this is leather. Like, yeah. look at this. And the craftsmanship. And like, look at, yeah, the craftsmanship. Look at the soles. Or you yeah. can look at a pair of sneakers and be like, those are uncomfortable. I can look at them and tell. You know what I mean? Because of the soles or whatever. So yeah. there's a lot that goes into it. So I see why people don't want to wear them. <laughs> Yeah, and then you know, I would I would say that whiskey is even more fascinating because of the fact that you can get so many different flavors. You know what I yeah. mean? Depending on the barrel, or the amount of resident in um rum barrels, or yeah. a wine barrel, or whatever it is, high corn, high rye, and then if you add a drop of water to it, it turns into something else. Yes, and I love how you said that, and I love your outlook on whiskey, because what that shows me is, like, it, it gives me hope that there's a whiskey out there for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And just because you like a specific whiskey doesn't mean that you have to hate another one, you know? Because they yeah. so different, like you said, the mash bills, yeah. the beans, diluting yeah. it with water and having it oxidize and open up, you know? Yeah. One of our whiskeys that is really dangerously cast proof is, I don't, oh, is this one. Cavalon. Mmm, that's not the one I have. Okay. You have the, oh, you have the distillery select. Nice. And that's a, that's a cast, that's a cast. Yeah, so they, it's like 115, Ooh, but this thing, yes. it's so, it's dangerously smooth. Nice, nice. Yeah. All right, so, yeah. Yeah, I love, I love, I love that. How and like people are like, oh, you'll work with another brand. I'm like, yeah, of course. You know, because the way I see it is, we're educating consumers more, and we're developing their pa their palate more. So therefore, it allows for more innovation and more booze to be bought. <laughs> yeah, that right and consumed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yo, man. Um, you know, I like to say because you know, Zoom, you start running out of time. So let me get, let me say this that um, as, as far as holding is concerned, um, I think it's beautiful and it's pretty dope that you work for a company who recognized your potential and your talent and, and was able to bring you out to the West Coast from the East Coast and, and, and uh, allow you to um, thrive and give you the room to thrive. So that's great. And I'm happy for you with, with that. You know? Yeah, thank you. I mean, you're, you're right. You hit the nail on the head. I. Like I told you before, I came here, I was actually going to leave the booze industry and it wasn't for my, my old boss, Krista Harris. You know, she saw that passion in me and I am so fortunate to only work with a company that believes in me, but they believe in all of their people. They're so helpful. Like, what can we do for you? And we got some dope brands. So. Yeah. yeah, it's dope. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you're glowing. You know what I'm saying? You got that glow. You look happy. And, uh, you look amazing, and, that's, and that's great. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we, we spend a lot of time working. So it's good to be happy in your work. It is. You know what I mean? So um, anything else, man? What else you want to share with the people? Anything you want to get out of that I didn't touch on? Yeah, I just want to let people know that don't be scared to try a new whiskey. Um, you know, my biggest advice for trying something new is do a little research, you know, and sometimes the popular opinion may not also be your opinion. Yeah. You know, we all have different palettes. We all have different um, memories because it's tied to your, uh, or taste because it's tied to your memory. Yeah. So don't be afraid to be adventurous with your whiskey um read up on it and you know have a good time with your whiskey take your time man sip it yeah take your time yeah. and then also go grab a bottle of hirsch <laughs> there you go i'm <laughs> with it i'm not i'm yeah. i would tell it's you so good. yeah I'm, I'm telling you right now man this is my kind of bourbon right here um people tell me i don't like i don't like whiskey i'm like yeah you like whiskey you just don't realize it yet or same exactly. with you. You know, you you don't. Yeah. This is your granddad's gin. Gin is different now than what it was. It then. so is. Oh. So don't tell me what you don't like, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you don't like it because you haven't found the one right for you. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I'm excited. I really appreciate you like having me on, and we can you know get something on the books later on and talk about old P. We can yes. talk about the Northern Border Collection that we have up from our guys in. Um, Corby Distillery, or sorry, here in Walker Distillery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna, uh, we'll get back yeah, on the phone because, and I'm not gonna crack this open until I, I break it open on, on camera with you. How about oh, you're so sweet. You can, right. you can have a little taste test. Me, me, but I like to be genuine when I first taste it on camera. Oh, I want people to, you know, say it. So, I mean, you know, if you're down to get back on here in a couple of weeks or something, or yeah. you know, we'll figure out schedules and we'll make it here because you sent me a lot of stuff, man. So I want to get this stuff out here so people can see it. Um, but how, how can they reach, uh, you know, you or yeah. and, or the brand and everything? Yeah. So um, if you go on Instagram, my Instagram is Aleka, A-L-E-K-A, on the rocks. And rocks is spelled R-O-X. And then Hodeline, um, Hodeline & Co. is our Instagram. And then we have all of our brands there that you can individually follow. And then once again, the Hirsch can be picked up at reservebar.com. Or you can find it through our product finder on hodelineandco.com by putting in your zip code and the product that you want to look for. And the holding is spelled H-O-T-A-L-I-N-G, correct? Boom. Boom, you know, I've been, I've, been drinking, I've been drinking whiskey, and I still got it right. So y'all got it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, um, Aleka, I appreciate you, man. Uh, I appreciate you, and you I'm enjoy the rest you. of your week, okay? Stay, no. stay cool out in that East Coast heat. Yeah, I, I, I didn't even go outside today. COVID is taking care of that, so. Right. <laughs> I know San Francisco, it could be, you think it's nice outside, and all of a sudden that wind kick up, and I was like, I need a jacket. <laughs> so take care out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Right, cheers. Cheers.